I'm so honored to be here and I'm gonna give you, this is what I wanted to give you is to try to give you everything I know. I'd love you to know, to see ADHD the way I see it. And I spend my January every year going to every possible conference by the lead researchers in the field of ADHD. And I feel very sorry for my practice because I'm gone most of January and I even got into one conference by sort of pretending I was a researcher and they seemed to leave me, let me in. And um, so what I want you to have is all the information, the way doctors have it. Because I, I, so much when I'm at these conferences, I'm thinking if my patients could hear this, if the parents could hear it, they wouldn't be so worried about treatment. They wouldn't be so worried about why I'm making these recommendations because they would know how this is so heavily researched. So that's, the, that's my goal here. I have tons of information and I probably won't get through it all and I may not get to the medicine in peace and that's okay because there's lots of resources for you to see that I've included in the back um, so I'll get as far as I can and we hopefully will have time for questions but really um, this is an update and all the research and of all the things that are well researched in psychiatry it is ADHD there's better quality of studies better people doing the studies it is the most rigorously researched topic in all of my field and with that it still is a you know a hot topic in and of itself and you know, in magazines and what we hear on the news and what we hear from friends, you know, it doesn't even, is it even real? And it is really I, I just, you know, wild that it is the most rigorously researched and yet at the same, same time most controversial. And I love things from different countries. And when I came across this slide at a conference, I took a lot of the researchers' slides. I tried to give them all credit. Um, and since this isn't for me selling, I'm hoping they forgive me. But um, this this highlights the prevalence the or what is diagnosed diagnosed, I should say, not prevalence, of diagnosed ADHD throughout the world. And at the top are two US kinds of ways of measuring it, um, the top two. Um, and then the third one is Canada, and then all the other countries down below. When really, when rigorously diagnosed, well diagnosed, the worldwide prevalence is the same. It's uh, agreed upon that it's probably about 5%. Um, and just diagnosed differently in different countries. And certainly if we went through a bunch of just checklists, you know, actually even more than 5% of kids would show up having attention or hyperactivity, but that is not the way to diagnose. And that's where possibly the overdiagnosis in certain places come up. Um, but generally speaking, worldwide, same prevalence. And there's, you know, well over, I put together all the numbers only through 2017 to um, over 30,000 studies and all peer-reviewed in over a thousand studies a year and these are all the names I none of them are in here so I won't um, get in trouble for not leaving someone but these are all the main researchers top people in the world and when you hear these people speak they're not the fringe I shouldn't say this about my field about mental health, but they're not the fringe mental health professionals. These are just phenomenal physicians. And when you know, when any of us go to a physician and we come away like, oh my gosh, that person was so brilliant, so I feel so good in their hands. And that's what these ADHD researchers are. They're just phenomenal physicians, and um, all of them are doing remarkable research. And I left room for one in case I ever need to put one there. And I see one in the audience, and I can just put it right there. So these are the these are the topics that I want to go through. First and foremost, I. Um, I cannot believe that we now have brain imaging, because this was not here when I was first um, starting in my field, that highlights as the true differences. And I want every parent um, of a child with ADHD to have seen this, to see how real it is. Um, and then I'm gonna talk about the genetics, since that is a very hot topic in this, with reference to the genetic testing and why it's not as simple as it seems. I wanna talk about the most cutting edge research um, about lifespan and treatment implications. And then if I can get to medications, I will. If if not, I will give you where to look at. And so with that, the radio imaging uh, research is now stronger than ever and continues to get stronger to show differences of brains of kids who have ADHD versus those who don't. And um, the, just to back up, this is um, a guy who does ADHD research, but he's most famous for doing the teen brain research. And it's so wild that really, you know, just less than, well, depending on how many lights there are, you know, but 15, 20 minutes from us is NIH with these 
Oscars, you know, of ADHD, and that's why I say Oscars. And when they speak at these conferences, everyone's, oh, you know, this person's speaking, and um, just absolute geniuses. But so if anybody's looked at National Geographic on the teen brain, seen how the, um, you know, how we now know the way the teen brain develops, and this is relevant to the ADHD research, so I'm gonna give you this real quick. So when any part of the brain develops, what happens is there's thickening of nerve cells. So these are little baby nerve cells on the left and grown up nerve cells on the right, and nerve cells are long like squids, and when they grow, they get all bushy and reach out for connections, and if a connection is made, that part of the, that, that connection, that synapse, you, uh, you know, a child, a brain keeps for the rest of one's life. If a connection isn't made during that time of neuroplasticity, those nerve cells kind of wither off and die. So each part of the brain, when it's programmed to develop, every part of the brain is programmed to develop at a different time, reaches out gets thicker, so there's thickening of the cortex, and then thinning as those connections are refined. And we know that certainly from language circuits. If you're exposed to certain sounds before the age of three um, in a particular language, you, you, know, you will keep those nerve cells. And then otherwise, you know, those of us who didn't grow up hearing you know, Chinese or other languages will not ever be able to perfectly be fluent because that part of the brain has thickened and thinned already. And so this guy, and this was really the stuff that made me change my whole trajectory in medical school where I was going. Jay Gee, Dr. Gee, I would never call him Jay to his face, but a wonderful person. But um, the, on the left is age five into the 20s down on the right. And this is the best one to look at is the one looking, you know, on the bottom. Bottom of the brain is, back of the brain is the bottom part, front of the brain is the top. And more mature brain is the purple. And has everybody seen this video? I try to put this in every lecture I give, even if it's not relevant, because this shows if I can do it, um, yeah. So you can see a brain maturing from back to front. And that's, that's all from this MRI data, that the front part of the brain develops last. And that's relevant to ADHD and to, and it's so funny to me that little kids now know what the prefrontal cortex is. And when I'm explaining to them about impulse, impulse control, they'll be like, oh, yeah, that's my prefrontal cortex. And, um, and, I, and I, like, you know, when I was in med school, it took me, I was like, oh, prefrontal cortex. But we, and we didn't even use the word executive functioning when I was in medical school, unless I slept through it, which could have been, well, I actually I didn't. I was so nervous. I never slept there. But, um, but, but this front part of the brain, last part of the brain to develop, it's the part of the brain that makes us a grown-up, last part of the brain to develop and highly relevant to ADHD, and that is what is related to executive functioning, all the executive management of the brain, the executive being like the executive of business or government, and impulse control inhibition, inhibiting our impulses and allowing us to be a grown up. If you've ever laid awake wondering how impulse control is measured, this is um, age on the x-axis is, um, is age on the x-axis, then why is impulse control, and it's measured um, over and over, well validated by this little game um, um, that one could play where there's little mole, it's a computer game, and when you whack the mole with the, um, you know, you're trying to get points by whacking the mole when you see it, but when you don't see it, you're not supposed to whack it. So it's it's measuring your ability to inhibit your impulse and not whack it. And you see that when we are trying to not whack it. We're engaging, this is looking down on the brain, that front part of the brain. And that no-go, meaning not, not whacking it, means inhibiting our impulses. And with age, you see kids have lots of false, po false positives, aren't able to access as much. And with adults, it's more turned on. And that's relevant to ADHD in that not only that front part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, the last part of the brain to grow up for any of us, not until our late 20s, is what is delayed in ADHD. And it's not only the part of the brain that helps you inhibit impulses, but of course, sit with things you don't want to do, tune out distractions, be able to see cause and effect, manage time, plan, see the bigger picture. And very importantly, even though I'm not going to go into it in the context of this lecture, helps us regulate our emotions, and that's why that amygdala is there. The frontal lobe is the brakes for the emotional part of the brain, and that's why so many kids with ADD have trouble with regulating their emotions and not going from here to here all in a moment. And even though it's not in the diagnostic criteria and not what I could fit into this lecture, most um, professionals at these research conferences are now talking about why that needs to change since it's more common than not. So when this study came out, Dr. Shaw's colleague, Dr. Philip Shaw 
Shaw, who's been here. And when I was asked to speak, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to be speaking at Dr. Shaw's research. And he was here at lab school a few years ago. And I've watched his lab, um, lab school lecture over and over and over and was nervous to prevent, present this. But he's a wonderful Irish guy that looks very young um, for doing decades of research. And he's the one that showed that this front part of the brain, he, he had hundreds of kids and he measured, the, I looked at all these you know, points, 40,000 points of the brain and measured their brains from age five going into the 20s. Um, but, and he showed that the front part of the brain was about three, not just the front part of the brain, all these areas connected to about three to five years delayed. And I was there really one of the very first times he presented this. It was like I got special tickets to go. And when he showed that there was this lag in the development, especially in the front part of the brain, and how just seeing for the very first time imaging studies that ADHD is real and that kids can't help it, it was so silent. It was like you could hear a pin drop. It was for real seeing that this was biologic and not a matter of attitude, behavioral problems, poor parenting, that really kids just had about a three-year lag. And when you think, all of us who have a child with ADD, and we think about that maturity, it really fits that they're about three years behind in certain areas. And this is the video. Has anybody seen this video about developing brain comparing kids who don't have ADD compared to those who do. If you've seen this, will you raise your hand? So it's one that I just, it's one of these things where I feel like if everybody could see this, there's kids on the right who don't have it and that lag, and this is all going through the different ages of kids who have it, and really highlighting that they just can't help it. And although you can sit here on a beautiful spring night and pay attention for an hour, you know, what we ask kids to do now, even though, yes, we all went through school, it's so much harder. There's so much stuff. There's annotating. Where did that come from? I don't know. I didn't do that. Just so much stuff. And I, you know, I also, I, I have this, I had this hope. I couldn't help but put this in here because I knew this was going to be on the lab school website. Like, Tom Cruise, if you're listening, ADHD is real because that's that imaging study. You know, all the all these people that say, "Oh, it's just just you know psychiatrists just making this up or parents not doing what they need to." That's ridiculous. It's it's completely real. Now, there's even a bigger study, bigger study than Dr. Shaw's study. And British British folks, when they have a study, they give it cool names. They call theirs the Enigma study, and it's a massive study, and other countries are now leading the way in ADHD research, even above the US in many ways, and that also is highlighting on this massive grand scale the, um, the, the major differences, not just at the structural level, but in other ways in, in kids who really have ADHD. Um, uh, and that really, you also see in longer term outcomes that there's more impaired cortical thickness in, um, in, you know, in kids who, in, in, in adults who don't grow out of ADD. Um, that's more of a um, topic of a different lecture. This is the other slide. And as I was putting this lecture together, I was feeling really guilty for not showing the parents in my practice this before. I don't know why I haven't shown you this for those of you sitting here. But this study was done also by Dr. Shaw, and it must have been done you know, in tandem with his study showing the brain differences. And it looked at what happens to kids who are taking medicines for ADD long term. And of course, really important parent question to ask for a child taking medicine is what happens to a brain taking this medicine longer term. And this is, I don't know why I haven't showed um, people I practice this, but if you look at, this is kids who started the medicine probably around age nine or 10. And the blue is kids who don't have, they say typically developing cohort, kids who don't have ADHD. The um, green is the um, kids, kids who are taking medicine who have ADHD, taking stimulants, um, the typical medicines. And the yellow is kids with ADHD who were not taking medicine. And you see at age 12 when that um, brain is, you know, for, for kids who don't have ADHD, there's that thickening and thinning that peaks at about age 10 for kids without ADHD, about 13 for kids with ADHD. So there's that thickening I talked about, that branching out. And you see in kids who have ADHD, it's a little thicker because they're a couple years behind. But in the kids um, who are taking medicine at, at about age 16 and a half, you see that thickening and thinning is you know, pretty similar of the kids um, taking medicine compared to those who didn't have ADHD. And the kids who did not take medicine 
they're, they're, they have much more cortical thinness. There's more rapid cortical thinning. And this, this study, you know, really leads us to think it's not, you know, it's not perfect in that it's not like at the level of the Enigma study yet, but that really it's not that these, these medicines don't have any negative impact on developing brain. And we don't even have that for medicines like Benadryl. We don't have it for stomach medicines, other medicines. We don't know what they do to developing brains, but we know that for stimulants, the brain develops normally and that possibly that this is more like, you know, how I look at, you know, wearing braces, um, that it's, it, it's something that could have, a, you know, a big advantage by doing it earlier. And this has been replicated in other studies. And it's just one of those ones that any parent, when you see this, it's like, ha, ah, do, doing this early could have huge advantages because the brain is only plastic molding and shaping in that frontal part of the brain one time in your life. Okay, I'm going to just, I'm looking at the time. I want to talk about genetics. And this is supposed to make you really confused because one of the things I want to convey, one of the biggest things, is that the genetics and all this genetic testing that makes it look so simple and um, about how to predict medicine is not as simple as it sounds. But with that, of all the things that are genetic in child psychiatry, ADHD almost tops the list. There's only two other things that are more hereditary than ADHD, and that's bipolar disorder and autism. And just to you know, give you an example of what heritability is, so the heritability index, a statistical measure, which is calculated on identi by identical twin studies for ADHD is 0.76, which is higher than the heritability of IQ, higher than, the person than um, personality traits, higher than height, which is, or not higher than height, almost as high as height, higher than asthma, higher than ca uh, breast cancer. So, so of all the things, you know, that are heritable, it's this. And we can look at our own, you know, of the relatives we have in our family and how they fared to really get an idea about how kids fare. But it's highly heritable. But the heritability is complicated. It's not a single gene. It's not like, um, you know, being colorblind or um, other other you know, just um, gene or hereditary disorders is just one gene. It's many, many genes. And there's many, many ways that I'm, I'm going to go through the main four that um, ADHD is, her um, is heritable. First is that there's all these genes that have been isolated related to ADHD. There's, you know, be somewhere between 20 and 35 different genes. And it's a little complicated. So just remembering high school biology, when genes, DNA, the way, the way they manifest themselves in our body is they're translated into proteins, they're translated to enzymes, they're translated to things that make up our bodies and make the chemical reactions in our bodies. And there's all these different genes, and that's why this slide is very complicated for you, that are related to ADHD, and they, you know, they help with, you know, what, what level of dopamine's there, what the cells are made of, how many receptors there are, how the transmission is, what the structure of the frontal cortex is, all the connections, so, so complicated. And to give you a taste of how complicated, there's all these different genes that code for, say, this is one of the nerve cells, this is a dopamine receptor genes that actually recycle dopamine, that is what medicines increase in the synapse and make, you know, to reuse and recycle. There's breakdown of dopamine, the COMT thing. There's what are post-receptor signaling. There's all these different things that all the genes code for, all have been isolated, related to um, different families and how we, how so um, we pass on genes to our young, but super, super complicated. Um, other way that genes, um, that, that a child can have ADHD is through new mutations, and certainly that's a, that's a only 10% is thought of genetic stuff, but the older we are, and a lot of us physicians, we have our kids late, and we have a higher risk for having kids with autism, and some other things just because the um, sperm and eggs, you know, cells are been around for longer and can be exposed to more stuff. Um, but that's, that's a small component of ADHD. This this is a freaky thing, and I decided not to make a freaky slide, but when I was in medical school, we were told, and I even majored in genetics in college, that everything I learned was going to be completely prehistoric, you know, like cupping and leeches by the time I was my age. And I didn't believe it. I was like, no, Watson and Crick, we know all this, and I studied it all, and I knew it all. And then I went to a genetic conference last year, and it really was. I mean, there's a lot of things that makes me feel old, but that really did. And now we, it's found that genes, we know we get one from our mom, one from our dad's set of chromosomes. They jump onto each other and mix each other up. So super complicated that way and freaky. And I thought it was just, 
I, I just couldn't believe it when I heard it. And then finally, this is the new cutting edge of genetic research is this area of epigenetics. So it's not only our genes that we pass on, but we pass on in our genes, there's a uh, susceptibility that's passed on. And just like, you know, some of us may have genetic tendencies towards certain cancers, but if we're exposed to, say, say we have genetic um, tendency towards melanoma, and we're exposed to so much, so much sun, then what happens can happen, and not just necessarily, this is, I'm not saying it correctly with melanoma, but with other cancers or other things that are inherited, is there's, there's things that sit on genes, what are called promoter regions, that protect the gene from being, it's like the, it gets popped off because of environmental influences or experiences. And now it's you know really seen in ways in the genetic research around ADHD that you can pass on a tendency and depending on what is in the environment, it can get you know popped off or turned on or off, just like turning off or on a switch. And it's the exposure that gets turned on, and it's um and it's things like you know to make simple you know just lead exposure, anemia, or even life experiences. And because it is it's not just our genes that we inherit, but what we're around that affects whether they turn on or off. And this is super complicated. Again, to show you how complicated the way. Of a gene is read if about whether to be turned on or off. It gets these flags on it. They're methyl groups. This is organic chemistry more than I should be talking about here. But uh, the you know with having a flag can 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 highlight. Oh, it's time to turn this baby on. And this is this interaction of genes and the environment. This is an excellent book. One of the hot new books about ADHD is written by a guy that I heard speak at one of these conferences, um, Dr. Joel Nig, and he wrote a book that is um, on getting ahead of ADHD. It's superb about the neurobiology and the cutting edge research um, of this. And it's not just that the genes determined who we are, but our environment. And that's certainly true. This is some bummer stuff here that I'm about to talk about. And this is not to make you feel guilty. Um, this is all of us are human as parents, but certainly bad news is, and it's hard to talk about this stuff, is that there's you know excellent studies that highlight high levels of parental criticism. High, EE, something called emotional expression, is a bad word in psychiatry. It's a code word. When we talk about parents having too much EE, it is how I was behaving right at the end of spring break last year when I was told by my daughter that there had, was no homework. There was no homework. There was nothing going on. That's why she was sitting around doing nothing on spring break. And then the Monday of spring break, as we're, you know, heading off, it's science project. You know, like the big ones with the posters and like that you do for months. And I was not the model of good EE. I mean, it was just, it was like, I almost feel that there should be a, um, a, a reality show of being in a child psychiatrist's home. It's like I dish this out all day long. And then like, if she could have got it on video, it was so bad. And that was bad EE and criticism and all sorts of horrible stuff. But that over and over, which all of us, any of us who have a child with ADHD, you know, we keep on having a reprimand, reprimand, negative, negative, that that is bad for developing brains. Now, is it bad at the developing, you know, at the, at the genetic level? Or is it bad by bathing the brain in high levels of cortisol as the cortex is developing? But it's, it's an example of experience changing outcomes and it's something to be mindful of. So the take home message is, is genetic stuff is super, super complicated as I showed you. And that's why, and I'll whiz through this, I could make a whole lecture about this, this genetic testing. Who knows about the genetic testing and being able to predict ADHD medicine stuff? Okay, so a couple of you. So a couple of you heard about it, but all of you will hear about it soon, and it's something that it comes up an awful lot, and I really want you to know what researchers know and to know the truth, because unfortunately, the companies that market genetic stuff are not regulated by the FDA the way medicines are. And so even when they first came out, I was so excited because this looked like this was gonna be the new millennium of being able to predict what medicine would work ahead of time, but we're not there yet for ADHD. That's like given the whole um, shebang that I was gonna talk about. But there are some things that are helpful about it. So 
what these tests do is they measure, um, and these are some of the names, you know, most of us know 23andMe, which has lots of cool stuff on it. I'm all for getting these, but they need to be interpreted, interpreted um, well. There's what are called pharmacokinetic tests and pharmacodynamic tests. So the pharmacokinetic test is where the, the true evidence base is, and that's looking at how we metabolize medicines. So all majority, it's really easy for a child psychiatry or neurology board exam, multiple choice test. Most of the medicines I prescribe are metabolized by the liver. There's only a handful by the kidney, so if you say liver, pretty much get it right most of the time. And there's a very fancy set of enzymes. I say fancy because it's called the cytochrome P450 system. Makes it sound super fancy. I once knew why it's called that. There's a doctor in the... Um, in this audience, who I'm sure if she, I could make her say what it is, but I'm not going to look at her. But um, but it's it's a it's how we metabolize medicines. And some of us, based on our genes, have slow enzymes. Some have faster enzymes. It's different from how we metabolize fo food. So how we metabolize medicine is in our liver. We can metabolize be slow metabolizers food wise, fast metabolizers of medicine. And a lot of the attention medicines um, can have variable levels based on how fast we metabolize. And this is where, and this is always the second page of those panels, this is useful information. It's not necessary information, you can f usually figure it out clinically, but it's useful information. And one example um, that really you know, made me very glad to be able to do this is I had a girl come to me, a teenager, um, who came to me because it was thought she was depressed and because she slept all the time. She slept all the time, she came to my office, she was like, I'm just so sorry, I'm so, so tired. But she was smiling, she was really positive, she just slept all the time. And um, couldn't do anything but sleep, but super positive, super happy, and no other symptoms of depression, even though um, everyone thought she was depressed. And her medicine for attention kept on being increased, because everyone thought that she just couldn't focus, and that's why she was sleepy, and she was so sleepy, and she was nodding off in my office. Um, so I, I got, I got this stuff because I was like, I don't know what's going on. And so I got this and could see that she had like the slowest enzyme for the, for, the met, for the enzyme that breaks down Adderall. And her Adderall dose had been elevated to try to wake her up and to be able to wake her up and class be able to focus. But what was happening by her not being able to clear the Adderall because she had this slow enzyme is it was lingering and she was never going into deep sleep. So I got a sleep study. She's never going to deep sleep. She was awake all night, never getting a deep sleep. So she was chronically profoundly sleep deprived, acting like a narcoleptic person. And when it was stopped, she perked up like that little Robin Williams movie where everyone like perks up with the dopamine. That's what it was like. She perked up. She was still, you know, really inattentive, but it was better than being like Sleeping Beauty. And she, and, 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 and that's where it was useful. So for side effects, super useful. Interactions with other medicines, when you layer on different medicines, useful. Challenges, and this is where the hype is, is these companies will say, and I went through a phase where I like even interviewed a lot of the directors of the companies. They thought I just wanted like, you know, send them a bunch of people, but I asked to actually ask for an interview with one of them, and it's because I wanted to show them all the studies I looked at for what they were purporting was why these, you know, why um, these you could predict efficacy, and they will claim that you can predict efficacy based on what are called pharmacodynamic genes, which is how these medicines interact. And if you remember, there's all these different genes. So the one that they, the main one they look at, and they look at the COMT gene in the DRD2 receptor. And if you have certain ones, you they say that you should not take stimulants. Um, but if you notice, you know that CMT is like one of all these things. The DRD is just one other thing, and how dopamine is transmitted. So there's a lot of other things, and although there's correlations, it's not causation. And so at this point, the consensus statement, when you go to conferences, and I went to an entire genetics and ADHD conference in January, it lasted two straight days, and you're getting the synthesis of it all, is that it can't predict what medicine will work. There's there's some depression medicines where it actually will. That's the cool stuff. That's really cool. And even, you know, the, especially depression with psychosis, something really not relevant with this talk. So exaggerated stuff. It can help with side effects. It can, when a kid's not responding, might be useful information, seeing if they're not clearing or if they're metabolizing it super fast and rip-roaring through it and it's gone by 10 a.m. But that's that's the important stuff to know. And the other my other little beef with them is when they do the printouts, this is that pharmacodynamic stuff. So they have in the fine print COMT, like slower response, DRD, slow response. And then with that, because they will say that's related to stimulant problems, they'll put in yellow and red the bulk of the attention medicines. And understandably, if a parent has seen this, they'll be like, well, we can just only use Stratera. 
And, and that really limits. So that's important to see since they're not regulated and there's hype. The, the gold is looking at the metabolism stuff and that's especially relevant to antidepressants and the, what I was talking about with not being able to clear it. So I talked about why that's confusing. I think it's super important. And from the experts, it's not a way to treat or um, diagnose. But in the future, you know, there's, there's so much up and coming. Okay, even though I'm not sure that I'm gonna get to all the medicine stuff, I'm gonna talk about um, some of the really big stuff when it comes to why it's important to treat. And I just, I wanna, as I talk about this, I wanna highlight, and this is to reassure you not to make you worry, because some of the stuff about lifespan, when you look at it, can make you like kind of freaked out. Um, and, and of all the things that are treatable, Absolutely, it's attention um, deficit. So I really, you know, and, and it's not something to make you cry, make you worried for the future, but it's what is at the cutting edge. So why is treatment important? Um, the, you know, so you look at ADHD, first of all, it's, it's not like, you know, certain other things, like with bipolar disorder, you have it or you don't. Um, there's certain other, you know, all these other medical things, tuberculosis, you have it or you don't. ADHD is a spectrum. And because of all those genes I showed you, there's all these ways it shows up. It's not, you know, whether just hyperactivity or impulsivity or tension, it's a spectrum. And it's a spectrum and it's an extreme of just normal human variation. And it's, and Joel Nag, Dr. Nag was, you know, highlights, it's really like blood pressure. You can have high or low and it's a spectrum. And for something to be a spectrum and something to be 5% prevalence, it has to have some evolutionary purpose and certainly you know there's there's you know plenty plenty of people who would agree that you know until the past you know till the kids are sitting in school and having to annotate and sit there for seven hours a day and like the binders and the you know all the all the just just drudgery that it's become harder and harder and since ADHD the impact of it is highly situational is certainly tougher in this day and age than it was 10,000 years ago the frontal lobe is the latest addition in evolution and I like this slide it's I don't want to offend anyone but I'm not a big f cat fan and so so you know humans have you know the front that's what differentiates us from other animals that in the language circuits and with with the evolution of the frontal lobe so has evolved the genes for ADHD well, I love this study where they there's a study um, out of a I think it's at a Northwestern, looking at a sub-Saharan tribe of nomads in Kenya that still are nomads, and they have close to a 100% prevalence of that of one of those dopamine receptor four genes, and um, and that's where it's still highly advantageous to be on the go. And they looked at um, a couple of those nomads, not a couple, um, uh, like a couple hundred of them that then recently settled in cities, and you saw the survival rate went down substantially, and that's in certain environments it's still advantageous just to not just be sitting there waiting for the water source to come for you. So ADHD is defined, disorder is, you know, it's, impair, it's impairment, it's, it's, it's if, it, if it's getting in the way, it's chronic and pervasive. And although there are books, there's a book that sounds really lovely called The Gift of ADHD. And some, you know, some of us would look at, you know, ADHD is bringing like a wealth of color to the universe and spontaneity. Dr. McGuff out of UCLA um, talks about it being somewhere between that, but then there's also Dr. Barkley, who I reference at the end and whose study I'm about to talk about, that really when you hear his, you know, wonderful podcast, I listen to his stuff a lot, which sounds like I don't have much to do with my life, but listen to it. But I do listen to a lot of his stuff. And, um, but he did, highlights how, what a nightmare it is to have, and it's probably somewhere in between. Um, and it's over years and years of having ADHD, you know, it's it's a developmental cruel, cruel of things being harder. And with that, um, the, the biggest concern I have in, like, what to do about it and when is really coming down to self-esteem. Um, we all know about the risks that come from having higher levels um, of impulsivity, and certainly, I'm sure all of you have seen, you know, the marshmallow test. Most researchers would say that the the biggest one of the biggest concerns, you know, in looking at development, and the things that cause humans trouble on this planet are deficits in self-control. All of you have seen the the marshmallow test, I'm sure, and I, when I teach. I'm teaching little kids in my practice about impulse control. I'll show them the marshmallow test, and it's, it always surprised me when kids, you know, say like, 
I would eat it, just eat it, just eat it, or don't eat it, don't eat it. And our ability to delay gratification having um, major, major impact in, you know, um, in longer term outcomes. And certainly with ADHD, this is, this is the bigger concern, the difficulty with being able to delay gratification. And that's where um, the higher risk stuff comes. And so, you know, this is the, you know, the scary stuff about ADHD, but it's real, you know, kids um, who are just lovely and wonderful that they just can't stay in college, that um, make over and over scary mistakes, the substance abuse risk um, so high, um, and it's, it's scary to look at, but um, important when it comes to the, uh, the treatment, it is so treatable. Uh, the hottest of all ADHD topics just came out in February 2019, so this is three months out, and he gave the keynote, Russell Barkley gave the keynote at the International Chad Conference about this, which I have linked in my notes, and you can listen to, it's available, Chad is the best, best resource ever, best of all the nonprofits for mental health, in my opinion. And they have all these incredible web webinars and, um, you know, just, just all the key evidence stuff all on their website. But when he, you know, presented this, he actually presented this preliminarily to child psychiatrists um, about 10 months before, um, highlighting from a massive study that he'd been doing for years and years using, um, you know, calculators from life insurance stuff, um, actuarial stuff stuff that really highlighted that when you even separate out, it's been known that, um, you know, kids with ADD and teenagers with ADD have a higher risk of dying. I know this is really morbid, but from suicide or from accidents, um, just from impulse control. But when that is separated out and looking at all these other factors that lead to longevity, that there's up to 18 year different in lifespan in um, humans diagnosed with ADHD. And his hypothesis about this, and this is hard to read, but really, really important, is that it comes down to the developing that trait of conscientiousness, that of all the things that are important for humans in the longer term success and in lifespan is the trait of conscientiousness because it is related to what we eat, how we take care of ourselves, how we regulate ourselves, how much sleep we get, you know, who, what are our goals, how hard do we work towards things, do we, you know, think about, you know, cause and effect and other medical issues, do we go to the doctor regularly, all these things as that brain is young that are developing and that really, and this is, was the other time I've been at a conference where silence. When he presented this, it was like the Philip Shaw stuff with the with seeing the brain differences with ADHD. And there was people from the World Health Organization there. It was so, so wild to see the data there that this mattered more than things like cholesterol, smoking when it comes to longevity. And of all the things, and this is where the promise is, that are that are easy to treat, not perfectly easy, or you know, be inst it would be instant gratification. It would be too too nice. But if the most the most treatable thing in all of psychiatry is ADHD, um, not that the medicines are without side effects, not that they treat everybody, but that it is the most treatable. And that's where the the at the end of this discussion, when it was so silent and World Health Organization and everyone jumping on it and now seen as a public health risk and other countries are gonna jump on this before we do, um, it was a message of hope. This is why, you know, doing something about it early. The other things that have been shown in the longer term related to ADHD and the importance of treatment, and this is an important thing to recognize because again, hard to give one's child medicine since medicine is can still considered the standard of care as part of a multimodal treatment plan is that treating actually reduces the risk of longer term depression and that's important because every psychiatric med can do anything and some people can feel depressed with ADHD medicines but by and large there's reduced risk of depression and again the bigger concern with ADHD is by feeling you know that you're always a step behind always a slow one always messing up always the one causing problems in the family having all of that growing up accrual of feeling like you're you're screwing up that that leads to poor self-esteem and depression actually treating reduces that risk. That's what I see is really, besides the risk with impulse control and of course this longevity stuff, really that the risk of identity, personality, self-esteem, and, and now we know, and this is a massive study, the Swedes and the Danes have led the way now um, in ADHD research because they did the coolest thing, especially the Danes, and when they lecture at conferences, it's a welcome difference from what we used to have with just Americans. It's really cool, these Swedish folks. But they, they back when, I guess, Denmark became Thank you. 
a country or when they developed their socialized um, you know, program, they had the foresight, even after just after World War II, every baby born in Denmark had a blood spot put on an index card because they knew that someday they might be able to do something with that and show all the genes. So they can see people who aren't even around anymore, they get their blood, can run all their genes and see who got you know, schizophrenia, who got cancer, who got diabetes, who got ADHD, who got depression. And they, can, they just have massive load. And that's why their studies are just ginormous and evidence-based and awesome. And now there's such an international consortium. Now all these conferences that I go to have international wizards you know, from all over the world. This is a cutting edge one, that, and this is important, and I'll probably close with this and leave the medicine piece um, for um, you to look at or talk to me about later or I'll give you the references because often with substance abuse parents understandably worry about these medicines causing addiction because as any of you who give your child this medicine knows that when you bring it to the pharmacy you have to show your driver's license they look you over and you feel like no really I'm really nice I'm not trying to get you like you know it's just so awkward and um, it's it's because these medicines are sold at you know my you know I'm a mater of UEA and um, Ah, the basketball. So, um, but I, I, you know, I, my insider dudes there tell me this time of year it's fifty bucks a tablet for Adderall. You know, these are abused, sold, misused, diverted. Um, they're controlled medicines. But this this guy, Dr. Willens, who's um, actually should say Willens here, but it doesn't. Um, uh, his I think that's his assistant that I don't know, but I'm sure he's wonderful. Um, but uh, he 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 did a study it's pretty recent looking at substance abuse, um, long term study. And so this is, um, you know, uh, on the left, kids who've, you know, ever been medicated for ADHD and then currently medicated is in the middle. And looking just, for instance, at the boys, um, kids, um, and it's the, rel it's the risk of them having substance abuse um, compared to uh, ki kids with ADHD who are not treated, where the risk of, you know, and this is a substance abuse related event, the risk of substance abuse in um, kids untreated for ADHD is, you know, is quite sky high and um, three times at least the risk of kids who don't have it. And you see that there's about a 70%, low, you know, 70%, um, you know, risk when, when kids have been treated in the past um, compared to not being treated and something like 60% lower risk of substance related events um, of kids who are currently medicated, showing the protective nature of kids having better impulse control. This one's way, this one's wild and pretty, pretty cool. And uh, um, I don't know if it's comforting or disturbing, but so this is um, the longer term substance abuse risk. And so the relative risk is, you know, this one on the right, the color coding doesn't really make sense. So kid without ADHD, of course, is one when you look at an Oz ratio. So that's what you're comparing this to. And on the far left is um, kids who had started to be treated for the ADHD before the age of nine. So little kids that were treated earlier on. And it's how it measures, you know, how long they were treated. So kids that were, and this was measured later when they were later adolescents. So kids in their later teenage times who were started treatment and um, treated um, for years on the left having about the same risk as kids who don't have ADHD in longer term substance abuse. When you look at kids who are older than 15 who only recently had started their medicine, you see that their risk of substance abuse is about 2.5 compared to kids who don't have it. And seeing that really there's an advantage um, very likely just with looking at that developing brain stuff of treating early and reducing substance abuse risk. So it really is seen by researchers that these medicines reduce substance abuse risk. I have to say, I have to say even though they are abused, and we have to watch that, and you know they're sold, like I said, I have yet, and this is my practice, and this is not national norms, and this is, you know, to say this, this is not evidence-based to base on my practice. You know, kids in my practice can't wait to stop taking medicine. None of them are like, Yay, I get to take my medicine every day. And so when, when, they, when they start to grow out of it, and that's where remembering about a third by age 18 on those MRI studies have grown out of it. And it's, um, and of course, the impact being situational when you start to take college classes that you love, when you're in a job that you love, when you're not sitting there for seven hours a day. Imagine doing this for seven hours a day. That's what your kids have done today. You know, well, it's spring break for some of you. But, um, but, uh, but um, it's, it's hard. It's hard. And so when you're doing that lesson, growing out of it, 
Um, you know, I, I, I just don't have a kid in my practice that's just so happy to not be taking medicine. And it's really the, a lot of the diversion, the concern on college, pra, uh, college, um, college campuses, um, you see a lot of the risk really with kids who've never been prescribed it in the first place and using it like speed. So it's, a, it's something to, it's important to think about and it's something to be regulated, but I just, mo most, most people can't wait to not be taking medicine. It's a slap in the face every day to have to take a medicine and even though we normalize that we try to talk about how this is a brain, I'm talking about brain boosters, like glasses for the brain. Um, the, the risk of reducing substance abuse is huge. I will leave time for questions instead of talking about medications. I will quickly say, though, that of all the things that I lose no sleep about, even though I'm concerned about overdiagnosis, I'm concerned about people not doing multimodal treatment. It's not all about the medicine. All of you know that. Um, it's you know that it's you know it's about you know looking at how um, we you know raise kids and help them in the schools and help from a multimodal standpoint. That but treatment is safe. It is effective. The medications have been around since 1937 for fighter pilots. Do all of you know that? I love it when people know that. That's Stimulants have been around since 1937. They're almost as old as antibiotics um, and have massive safety data, and we have massive data to support that they can be helpful in conjunction with multimodal treatment. And um, with that, I do a little shout out, and maybe that's where I'll stop. So I leave time for questions and not make it a discussion about the medicines. There's a great book by the guy who did the substance abuse studies. It's, it's one of those books. There's all these books that come out. I'm like, gosh, I wish I wrote that book. Um, and it's straight talk about psychiatric medications for kids um, that has just such a great discussion in it about these and the evidence base behind them. And certainly my slides um, have references. So with that, I think I'll stop for questions instead of going through all the medicine stuff. And, um, and if there's no questions, you can just go home. The question was, is there any, I'm going to paraphrase this, the, um, is there a possibility of using, being able to use those bench parts, be able to look at um, radio imaging to either diagnose or see where a kid is? Are they 2.5 years delayed or two years delayed? What, what could we use with radio imaging diagnostically to see where we are or even seeing if someone grows out of it? I'm paraphrasing. You didn't really say that, but that was the gist, correct? Um, And can we use it to find kids earlier than we do now, to identify early on? Um, and the answer is no. The, the sensitivity and specificity of neuroimaging is not at the point for in the individual to put someone in a scanner and be like, okay, you are three point years behind or, or, or that at that point. There's a total quack. I, I used to be afraid to say this, but once I turned 50, I just, things just fly out of me. And there's this guy, there's this guy and, um, that's, uh, I think he's got his own TV show, he's got a book, he says you can put your kid in a scanner, a spec scanner, um, for, f I think it was like four or five thousand dollars a few years ago, and be able to diagnose ADHD, and a spec scanner is considered like dinosaur imaging, in any case, it's pretty pictures, they're gorgeous stuff, I can see why it's appealing, and I, um, but, but at this point, the t it, this is looking at big populations to see those differences, and it's not there yet, when I asked, I, I get up, you know, all the, a lot of these people, the reason they know who I am is because I keep introducing myself at these conferences. They're like, oh, yeah, we met you at the last conference. And so when I asked, um, uh, I, it was, I think, Dr. Shaw about that who spoke here, and he, he, he said, or might have been, um, I think it was one of the others, actually, um, that it, probably it's more like 20 years away. I mean, I think one of them said, not in your career, which I was like, what do you mean by that? Not my career. I'm going to be working. Uh, but, um, but, I, but, I, but, I, um, but it's, it, we're not there yet. That's looking at populations. It's a great question, though. Thank you. Yeah. So the question was, um, with the substance abuse the green and blue was yeah was the waiting which which one are you looking at that they're really uh, those are those are people those are those are having waited till later so on the left is having been medicated for over I got to look at this side um, six years then three to five years is the green and then the gray is less than two years so the longer been medicated at those ages the better the outcomes no, so the, the non-stimulant, the, it's confusing because the blue is the reference one. The, the blue on the right is the, is the reference. That's why, that should be like a red color or something. Um, and then the blue is, is really for the, for, the, for the colors of this is, is, is greater than six years. That's what's confusing. 
Oh, that's an, oh, that's oh yeah, that's a bummer. I didn't say that. Non-stimulant is Stratera, Catve, and Tunov didn't look as good as the stimulants. Um, they're, still they're still medicated, but with the non-stimulants. And I, I think you know that that's where you know don't have you know as as the power from this study. I, there would be a lot of disagreement about that in in researchers because non-stimulants are effective for treating ADHD. There's no control with yes with without medication. There's the, the 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 least medicated would be the older than 16 year old older than the the ones that are older than 15 that been less than two years. With ADHD without medicating, it would be up at three to 3.5. It's complicated with substance abuse because dopamine. Um, is related to reward and reinforcement and stimulation, you know, feeding, just like kids wanting to have lots of sugar, you know, feeding the dopamine, those reinforcement centers, but the developmental accrual, and no, they aren't at all at lab, and they aren't, the impact of it being situationally specific, and if you're in a place where you feel good about yourself, and you're not feeling like you have no hope, and you just can only party on weekends, you know, because it's your only fun. No, they don't measure that. This is big populations. Great, great questions. No, many people don't grow out of it. Many people, then, and Dr. Barclay would say the majority do not grow out of it. Absolutely. Absolutely, this is not Pollyanna just, oh, everybody grows out of it. This is from that research, about a third catching up. Now, have they grown all out of it? That's their brains on imaging scans and seeing, um, you know, seeing normalization at, at that age. But um, the, the data about um, continuing to have symptoms into adulthood is very strong. The question is, um, if, if the, the idea that I have to repeat your question, um, that, that, you know, that, that people will grow out of it as their frontal lobes grow up um, into their 25, 30, you know, age 30, that that, that, that being, you know, a myth, is that, is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, and, um, and with, with the bulk, you look at your genes, like, you know, who, who in your family has ADHD, and if you have the kind of you know genes where there's long-term job loss, difficulty with marriages, not being able to get out the door, not be able to pay your bills, there, there's you know many genes associated with adult ADD. So not everybody grows out of it. I um, mean, look at your genes, uh, and and some people do. So so, but by and large the majority would say that most people don't grow out of all aspects. And also the impact in adulthood depends on what your situation is. If you're in a job where you have a lot of people managing your executive function weaknesses and you're not going to um, be you know, losing out that way, if you're on your own you know, within a day in certain jobs you know, and not having when someone manage you, you can get fired in a heartbeat. Or if you have emotion dysregulated in HDHD and you're at a board meeting and your boss is saying something obnoxious and you just say, you know, oh, that's just the most horrible thing to say, you know, bam, you're out. And so, so you, you look at your genes. Um, it's, it's tough, and by and large, I think most researchers would say the majority of people continue to have symptoms into adulthood, and that this is something that can get you in life, depending on where you are, more than others, and some people is lifelong impairment. The question is, how do you know um, when someone's grown out of it? How do you know when they're 18, 19, they've been taking it for years, um, and if it's time to stop the medicine, and if they've grown out of it? And because these are cognitive enhancing medicines, that's a really great question, because we could all have extra focus if we were taking these medicines. Um, what, what, you know, what one does in the conjunction of working with a doctor, and it's always tricky with the time of college. You don't just rip it, oh, you're 18, you're going to college, okay, bye, done. You know, because that's such the vulnerable time, is you, as growing into the 1820s, you know, either taper things a little, try a little bit of time without. If they're at a higher dose, you don't just stop it all of a sudden because then it takes a while to get to your baseline. But testing the waters um, carefully and with other people giving feedback. Our lens, if we have ADHD, of how we're performing is, blah. you know, self-report is not great. We're all blinded by our own brain. So parents, you know, and other people around being able to lend some, you know, really important feedback about what it's like without it to see if indeed it's impairing. The other thing that happens in kids that are growing out of it is that the, you can start to see more side effects and they feel flatter and over-medicated 
And again, you look at who you're related to, remembering that leaders in the field would say the majority go on to have symptoms, despite the imaging studies, and being wary of that, that it's not just free at 18. Um, but, but trying, testing the waters carefully. It's also hard, too, because the impact with driving is so high. And so, you know, there's much higher level risk of motor vehicle accidents in the kids who have young people with ADHD. So you just pull it away um, because of distracted driving. But carefully testing it, lowering it, and being cognizant of it. And also looking at the situation. If you're taking four classes two times a, w two times a day in college where you're not having, you know, to be focused for so long and getting mental fatigue. If you have high levels of impulse control, you're going to get in trouble wherever you go, and it's very clear, then you haven't grown out of it. Great. There's a question about long-term, like life seriously long, looking at treatment versus not treatment. There's the lifespan studies I told you about. Um, there's certainly uh, studies, um, the adult ADHD, um, I think major, major researcher is a guy named Dr. Biederman, Dr. Willens, I could talk to you about it more afterwards. Um, there's questions about women with menopause um, starting to have more, um, you know, if they had, had theoretically grown out of it or not having an impact from it, having more symptoms as their brains change. But long, long term, um, I don't know how far out the studies go, being someone who works with younger children, but there, there's more adult ADD studies than ever before. Uh, most of them, I, I think, out of Mass General. Um, but very good question. There's so many other things with age that are complicated and hard to study. And it's very hard. There's, there's no major, you can't keep someone in these expensive treatment studies for decades and decades. It's looking at big, you know, global symptoms like in the Scandinavian studies. Well, there, the, are there any changes or improvements in, di in diagnosis? Um, the, you know, the standard of care, you know, is excellent when it comes to, di to diagnosis. And of course, there's always a question of do you get psych testing or neuropsych testing? The diagnosis is, you know, from the standard from the standard of care is getting a very careful, developable, developmental, and medical you know evaluation, whether from a pediatrician, neurologist, or psychiatrist that looks developmentally at all the things that could lead to someone having ADHD symptoms and um, ruling in or out, whether it's learning disabilities, anxiety, or other components situationally. So very you know strong evaluation you know from individual exam, looking at genetic and hereditary history and other contributing factors that would clue you in getting testing um, and that's you know that's not always necessary but incredibly useful to rule out a learning disability um, those are those are still the main components but being not just symptom checklists those are important having teacher rating scales getting getting information from all different sectors not just individual especially the teacher piece being huge and teachers over the years to not just look at one situation um, but not not, not, not at the point of any magic scanner or something that you can put on the head to be able to see at this point. Well, 30% um, of depressed adults and I believe substance abuse have ADHD. The comorbidity is the rule. Um, and that is something I didn't talk about is how um, that you can have certainly more than one thing, and it's actually more the rule with ADHD is that other things travel with it, both genetically and situationally. But um, longer term, ADHD into bipolar, does, they're separate genes that, you know, it's a question of comorbidity. A lot of kids historically were misdiagnosed as having bipolar disorder, and that's part of that emotion regulation being that front part of the brain, and going from here to here and being moody or even violent or disinhibited when they really had ADHD and um, depressive tendencies. Yes, and so the, you think the misdiagnosis is more that way rather than being ADHD? Yes, the, um, although there's an area of dis, um, dis you know, dysregulated mood disorder, there's movement in the field, but there had been a hefty amount of overdiagnosis of bipolar disorder in the 90s, um, major study highlighting that um, the woman's name is Gabrielle Carlson, I think, that looked at um, kids diagnosed with bipolar disorder. I think it was a cohort of 302 looking at long-term, and they were diagnosed in the early adolescence and in their 20s only one or two of them had true bipolar disorder. It was actually less likely than in the community to have bipolar disorder. If you were diagnosed when you were young, less likely to have it for real later on. Complicated. So what's the question about diet, nutrition, omega-3s? Well, you know, first and foremost, 
from you know, a diet perspective, there's not a diet that treats ADHD. And of course, in my time down at Duke, there was the fine gold diet, diet research was the most bland, horrible diet and research looking at removing absolutely everything and could that by not having those sugars and dyes and having the most bland, horrible diet in the world treat ADHD and the answer was no. But that was also in the day where we were told as residents that dye didn't matter. And lo and behold, the studies now show that actually all those creepy dyes do, do when you have a sensitive brain can add to ADHD symptoms, so that is turned upside down. The bottom line is when you have a sensitive brain, you know, when you have it harder in any realm, whether you have ADHD, anxiety, depression, you want your brain to be at its best. You want all those connections to be function the best. You want to have the best sleep. You want to have the best nutrition. You don't want to have major fluctuations. You just have it harder to begin with. The um, omega stuff goes up and down. Some of the research showing doesn't help. Some show it does, it help, does help. Uh, I, I went to a phenomenal fish oil lecture by the um, leading researcher at NIH on fish oil. I should put his name in the little space. Um, and he highlighted that since, you know, Procter and Gamble invented Crisco, human brains in our country became made of disgusting, different stuff. Where our brains in this country are made of different fats and lipids. The brain is composed of 60% fat compared to Mediterranean diets. Their brains are made of different stuff. And since fatty acids line our nerve cells and make them go faster, having the right fatty acids for when you have it tougher and you have it tougher with attention makes a lot of sense. Does it treat ADHD in the short term? No, but in the long term, although there is this one that I really like and people in my practice know I like the fish oil stuff that had shown some promise and is used first line as an adjunct in other countries by Aaron, which is now no more. But uh, fish oils, by having the right stuff lining your brain could be good for brain development and certainly mood disorders. I'm, I'm a fan of it, but not in the, not, not that it could do it all alone um, because it makes so much sense to be making your brain chemistry of the right stuff um, rather than the Crisco, you know, so gross. Yes, I, do you think all of us should be taking fish oil? Yes, I mean, mega of anything is bad, even too much fish oil besides giving you disgusting, disgusting fish burps and fish breath, you know, that's gross. Um, but I once tried out a bunch at a conference, I put a bunch in my mouth, and the guy's like, you shouldn't have that many. And I was like, I wanna, I wanna see if it's gonna give the kids fish burps. He's like, they don't take six, you know? It's like, I was just, I was like, blah, blah, blah. But, um, but, but no, I, I think having the right, fit, you know, but the bottom line is eating fish, unless someone's vegetarian, is, is, is really important. Oh, a great book. A great book by one of the coolest psychiatrists ever, who's also, he's a, a Columbia, is called Fifty Shades of Kale. I gave it to everybody for the holidays this year. Nobody wrote a thank you note. Uh, but it's, it has all the research about food and brain health from an evidence-based, absolutely awesome psychiatrist who's also a farmer and is also a welcome great um, guy to hear speak. But he's a, it's a great book and it highlights the data about fish oil in the brain and mood disorders. Okay. Yes, yes, for your holiday gift list. Anyway, all right, thank you. It's a, I can answer yours later. Yeah.